Merrill Hodge, welcome to the show, my friend. It's good to be here, brother. It's a nice, yeah. good way to start the day. Of course. Great, high-impact, influential conversations, you know? Yeah, looking forward to it. No, no, definitely. Let's talk about growing up and the personal values, right? That is life lessons that shaped our life. What does that mean for you? Well, man, well, that's where all the journey began. You know, I thought probably really started for me at age eight when um, somebody asked me, like, hey, Merrill, what do you want to do? What do you want to be when you grow up? And I'm eight years old and I'm like, I have absolutely no idea. I'm like, but it was the, I wasn't frustrated by the question. I was actually intrigued by it because it was the first time the little scope of my mind had been widened. I started thinking about something I would never have thought of at that age had I not been challenged to do that. And, um, and that's actually when it started. I was like, wow, what would I want to do? That's interesting. And um, um, so I have to paint a picture when I speak. I, I paint a picture when this happened. Um, it happened in 1973. Um, in 1973, my, my dad was a milkman. So he would get up at 4.30 in the morning. He'd go on his route. Uh, he'd deliver milk to people would leave empty bottles of milk in a container on a porch. And he'd replace that with full bottles of milk. Um, you didn't go to the grocery store and get milk. It was delivered to you. Um but I didn't want to do that. I was like, I remember getting, getting, seeing him get up at 4.30 and I'm like, man, I'd never want to do that. <laughs> um, and not everybody had television in 1973. You know, you, you have to, cause you're living in this state, in this state, in these circumstances. So sometimes you have to, a reminder of what was around in 73 is important. You know, it, they weren't plastered all over the wall. Um, you're lucky if you had a TV. And if you did, it was a box about yay big, a antenna, two knobs, three channels, like and no remote. So you had to select the right channel before you got comfortable on the couch. And uh, we had a rule in our home that we couldn't watch television on Sunday. And um, so I used to love to go to my grandparents' house because uh, they always had their television on. Didn't matter what day a uh, week it was. It was not long after being asked, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? That um went to my grandparents' house on a Sunday. Uh, I walked in the kitchen. I looked to my left and there it is. Um, the Green Bay Packers were playing football on television. Now, the big deal wasn't the Packers were playing. The big deal was I had never seen football on television. This is the first time. I'd been playing in the backyard. Um, I had um, I just signed up for it, and I had no idea they were doing it on television. And the second I saw that, I was like, I know what I want to do. I know what I want to be. And and that's where it started. It it started with that that visual, and then I started to have. Um, I never lost it, you know. I, I was kind of, guys. I want. That's what I want to do. And um, a couple of years later, something happened. A significant thing happens. I I can't remember why the teacher did it, but the teacher in our in my class, she just walked in one day and she's like, you know, everybody needs to have goals and dreams, and and you need to write them down. And you need to stick them up and put them on your wall because it's where you start and end your day. It's how you should start your day every day. Man, she's telling me that she's going through this whole process, telling the telling to the entire class, and man, it just a light bulb went off. I was like, I love that idea. I was like, it was the coolest thought. I'd never, I never even thought of something like that. And then I started thinking. um I kind of had a problem because I, I had a brother that I shared a bedroom with and a bunk bed. So um, nothing was going to go up on my wall without it coming down. So that's why I'd say I used to pray diligently every night he would disappear. And it doesn't mean I didn't love him. Love him. I just want a home bedroom. <laughs> but I used to lay in bed at night and daydream. If I had my own bedroom, like there was one thing I would want I had never seen in a bedroom, but I thought would be the coolest thing to have in a bedroom. And that's a wall of cork. And that wall of cork would be so I could pin all my goals up. Um, actually, a couple of years later, I get my own bedroom and I asked my dad to make a wall of cork. And he ends up making me half a wall. It wasn't an entire wall, but man, it was big enough. And and that's kind of when the processing started with visuals, you know, putting them up. The words find a way came from that experience. And so those things really helped me. I always talk to people about, I don't care what. A person's circumstances, what hand they've been dealt in life, um, their goal, their dream, their challenge, the thing they want to start or stop. Man, visuals are and goals are a critical component in helping you control your mind. It does come down to this. Do you control your mind or does your mind control you? And that is the challenge for us all each and every day. You know, can we win that battle of controlling our mind? 
And when you have visuals and things you're looking forward to and you're striving for and your day is surrounded with that, it's a lot easier to control your mind than to let it wander. And uh, that's the first time I ever did it. I didn't realize the value in it at that time, you know, but it was the first time I ever did it at age 12. It was when I really put my first visual up and I look over at my board and I still have them to this day. It's not, a, it's not in my bedroom anymore, but it's in my office. And, and, um, it's really, it, it's been a principle that has really helped me, you know, um, with goals, dreams, and challenges. It's, it's so important. You know what I mean? That's why I never really understood, like, we all walk through different plights of life and not many folks have goals or visions. You know what I mean? It's like, well, how are you? Yo, guys, what's going on? I appreciate you. Thank you. Turn on all bell notifications, subscribe like and comment to the podcast it's the best way to stay up to date and hey it helps us gain the clarity and boost ourselves into that algorithm we appreciate the support each and every day each and every week let's keep on going to keep on growing peace how are you how are you maneuvering you know what i mean like what's the next step for you in the tetris levels you know what i mean because we've all played tetris you know yeah. what I mean? Nintendo days and stuff like that. So you had to go from level one to level two to level three, but it's like, have something tangible that you can really sink your teeth into, you know? Well, um, Rory, it's actually a, a good observation of, of a person, you know, um, talk about, you know, one of the greatest personal gifts a person can give themselves, you know, uh, I'll start with visuals, you know, having goals and dreams and a path that you're on. Um, and, and striving for things is I just think a critical component of growth, you know, in life and development. Um, but one of the, one of the greatest personal gifts a person can ever give themselves is, um, uh, it can be on the path during a journey, end of a journey on a path or a journey. And you do these moments. And I think self-reflection is a critical component of growth and development. And you check in with yourself, but you ask yourself these questions. Are you doing your part? Are you getting everything out of your God-given abilities? It might be the end of a dream, a journey, or a challenge, or a deadline, or a goal, or something you're trying to change, or start or stop. And it could be, did you do your part? And you're looking in the mirror. It's as, it's as simple as that. You're looking in the mirror when you're asking yourself these things. Because that's when you get the truth. Because you can sit there and go, yeah, I'm doing my part. And then no, you, you see you say, you're like, no, you're not. Because there've been many times in my life, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to go down a road, and I'm like, you're not doing your part. You're, really, you know, you've, you have stepping right now. That's why you're where you are. And that, that check in helps you challenge yourself, helps you grow. Um, but it also gives you peace when you can say yes. And I got everything out of my God given ability. Like my NFL career ended, I struggled. I had a, you know, I, I laid in, I went into cardiac arrest at the end of my career. Um, I had to learn how to read again. I was in intensive care for days. Um, I went through severe depression. Um, I had no hope. I had to start my life over at age 30, start it completely over from scratch. And I left something I'd been doing for 22 years abruptly in a way that uh, oftentimes doesn't even happen in the NFL career. I know a lot of injuries can happen. It's usually not by halfway into the into the season anyway it um it was a, a lot of toxic build up and challenges and um i was this is where i got you know in life you can point fingers cast blame and make excuses and that is a toxic blender of disaster that's garnered success by no one ever in fact people point fingers cast blame and make excuses you make your day easy but your tomorrow harder hmm. and I was doing that. That's how I know about the blender. I was in the blender. I was the best blender in the world. I had more excuses, more pointing fingers. I was angry. It was like I was devastated from every aspect of life. <clears throat> and the words find a way again would they would inspire a different mindset. They would they would spark an energy and and, and an action to do something about it. But it did something on that day I didn't even realize was a responsibility we all have in life. It's probably the first time, I think I'd done it other times, I just didn't realize how important it was to take ownership of where I wanted to go, what I wanted to do, and what I wanted to be. Now, 
taking ownership of your life is when actually things do change. It's the most pivotal aspect of a person's life. That doesn't mean that um, that p- things that have been done to you have been right. Okay, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that everything that has been done to you that might have been wrong, things that you have done that are that are wrong or made mistakes. Well, it's 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 a chance to end all of that and leave the trash behind you and create a new energy and a new focus and move forward and leave that garbage behind you. So what I mean by that is I was laying on that couch doing that every day. I was angry at the doctors. I was angry at the Bears. I was angry at the NFL. I was angry at everything because this is no way, the way my career should have ended. It was improper care. I could give you a litany of reasons that I was on that couch and excuses. But no one's getting me off that couch but me. And once I realized that and I got off that couch, I started to return the calls. And I'm not saying that that's the initial step of everybody. Listen, if, if you're depressed, you're probably living in the past. If you have anxiety, you're probably living in the future. And there's a lot of stuff that you can find out what your struggles are within your routine and the three thirds that make perfect health, which is nutrition exercise, activity, purpose, and rest. And if you looked at your routine and all those things, you could probably make the proper adjustments to correct the struggles that you're having. But it all starts with you. You you got to take that ownership and you got to start that. Now, having help along the way, listen, I've had a lot of help. But I'm a product of a lot of people. People have challenged me. People have inspired me. And getting help on that journey was important. However, it started with me. And once I got off the couch, that is when things started changing. And let's, uh, listen, I didn't just, everything just turned out all right. It took about a five-year journey to get to the point where I'm getting to next. It's the first time that I looked in the mirror and I had peace that I had done my part. I was working with at ESPN at the time. And um, um, I, was, I hate doing Super Bowls because all it did was remind me of the things I didn't accomplish. I, I, people go, what do you miss about playing in the NFL? And I'd say, every time I'd say, I, I missed what I didn't accomplish. The only reason I played, the only reason I wanted to play, I wanted to win the Super Bowl. Okay, and I, didn't, I didn't play in the Super Bowl, and I didn't win one. And so when that time came around, I just beat myself up, punished myself. I created all these things in my head that were um, unrealistic and stupid. Like I would start comparing myself to Walter Payton. <laughs> what work? Worst guy to compare yourself to ever, you know, if you're going to pick somebody, pick somebody better than that, right? So, so I'm doing all these things, the compound, and I was standing in front of the mirror. I'm getting ready to go um, to the super, to the plant, to the airport to catch a plan, uh, flight to Atlanta. And I remember just looking in the mirror and going, you know what? Could you have done more in your career? Did you, could you have trained harder, been more prepared? And man, I looked in my mirror and the mirror and I'm like, no, I'm like, oh my gosh, I got the most out of my God-given abilities. I got every ounce of athletic ability I had, I maximized it. And it got me to play nearly a decade in the National Football League and start for nearly a decade. I'm like, oh my gosh, I mean, man, I'm, I I couldn't do any more than that. I was like, I mean, finally, like, peace came over me. I was like, hey, you did your part. Stop it. Stop doing, creating all of this, all these things that are, not even realistic and don't exist and you're creating the, the issue that's how i understand you know if you're if you're depressed you're living in the past and oftentimes if you have anxiety you're living in the future and if you have both you're doing both and versus having perspective and that self-reflection and being honest with yourself and and taking ownership you know sometimes you say you know what i'm not doing my part well who's going to change that you are that's the power in it you you control all of that and once I start to learn those things um, and develop them, I call them tools for your tool belt of life. Just the journey and challenges and, and, and goals and dreams have just, they become an easier way to go about them without all of that, that ill will and all of those, all that garbage that can weigh you down that you're putting on your back. Not other people, you keep putting it there. And once I freed myself from that, man, it's just, Completely different, completely, completely different journey. No, no. And I love that you say everything that you said. It lands so, so well and it resonates with me so much. You know, redefining pivotal moments, right? What would you say was that one time, right? You speak about playing football, cardiac arrest, things like that. But how does those pivotal moments right now 
determine how you are doing like your speaking you're coming on podcasts and things like that well um it's funny i Oh, it's funny. It's just, it's interesting that I've never really thought much about this until here a couple, it was actually about a month ago. The thing that probably showed me the most about me, I learned most about me was when I was diagnosed with cancer. You know, when, when somebody said, Hey, listen, I, when my doctor said, I, I just don't know if what we can, the treatment's going to work, you know, um, when you hear that, you got a three pound tumor in your lower back and it's malignant and, you know, just the surviving of, of the actual treatment will be a challenge. Um, and then I can't guarantee what you're going to, what we're going to go, what you're going to go through is going to work for you. You're, um, the, they're the darkest days I've ever had. Um, uh, and anybody who, you know, I, I've done it before. You're like, you read a story, you hear somebody, somebody could be hearing this right now. And they could try to think about, like, how would you respond to that, being told that, you know, man, it's a 50-50 chance at best, um, three-pound tumor, and I don't know if it's going to work. Okay, so the reality of chemotherapy and dying are real for me, okay? There is no way you can create that reality. It's impossible unless it's literally told to you. And I know that because I've, you know, I've, I've seen other stories and heard about other things. And, well, if that happened to me, how, you know, how would you handle that? And I will tell you this, and in, in all truth, I had just written, I mean, read a book about somebody who had battled cancer and their journey was brutal. And I remember closing that book up going, man, that is one thing I couldn't handle. That's the one thing I'm just going to be self-anointed, ain't man enough to do that. I just couldn't do what that guy had to do and would withstand that journey. Then I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, my lifestyle, my family history. I got zero cancer. Um, and the odds of that are and genetically are like slim to none. Anyway, not a real worry. Almost a year ago, and then I've been told it. Then is when, and I did exactly what I thought. I I initially thought I I crumbled. It was the I call it the dark days of diagnosis. I was so overwhelmed. I was so caught up in dying. I was so caught up in chemotherapy. Um, um, and I understand the sting of death too, because I lost my mom when I was young and I know how that can wreck a home and change lives. And after I had shared with my kids what the doctor had shared with me, and I went back to that darkness, it was my daughter who came across the room. She's nine years old. Um, she has always been like, we've always been like this. And she crawled my lap. She had a little dainty arms around my neck and, and she was trying to get my attention because I was, I was just, I was just, gone in a darkness I I just so overwhelmed and dark in the, the just what I've had to what I've heard what I got to go through and she's look I find my cat her she gets my attention and I look at her and she says well then you know what dad you better find a way and and I say I find a way has been a parenting tool like my kids come walking in the room and they say hey I, they want to do a b and c or they got this problem I'm like well let's find a way okay so that I get them in charge of thinking, what do you got to do? What's your responsibility? I'll help with the journey, but I'm like, this ain't on me. Okay. This is on you, but I'm here to help you. That's that's, I'm glad you came to me, but what do you got to do? What do you think you need to do to get this done? Whether it's a challenge, a dream, whatever they're trying to do. So that, and it's challenged me to self-reflect as a parent, to be a better parent, you know, and break change. And then cycles happen to me as a kid, not pass them on to my kids. So, that's why I say those words have helped me live a dream and fight to live and a lot of in between have been so instrumental and, and they've given me hope. They've get, they've challenged me. They've given me hope. And that's what that the, the message of find a way is not about me. It's about you. It's about people realizing, Hey, you are in charge. Don't ever think you're not, you have the tools and gifts given to you. Just use them, strengthen them, train them, use whatever you hear from other people. Cause listen, if it's not been for like guys like uh, an Aristotle, where I read a quote that he, I'd read a lot of his quotes. I'd read a lot of stuff by accident too, by the way. <laughs> and, <laughs> but the quote is, we are what we repeatedly do. One of the most powerful things I've ever read, still a principle in my life, is we are what we repeatedly do. Therefore, excellence is not an act, but a habit. I read that as a kid. And I'm like, think about that. Think of the power and control in that. You are what you repeatedly to do. Truth. Everybody just goes down and you take inventory, just the routines I told you. You go through your routine. It's who you are. 
Okay. There's truth to that. What's great about that, if you don't like it, you can change it. If you like it, you should build on it. But you're in charge of that. And those patterns and habits are going to lead you to building your character. And that's going to eventually lead you to your destiny and your journey and help you find your way. So you're in charge of that. Like, that's an exciting thing. When I read that at 12, I was like, man, I had no room for air. And I'm like, man, if I do the right things and pattern the right things, I got a shot. And, and that's the first time I took, I, I, I realized, I didn't realize I took ownership of that journey in control of what I'm going to do, how I'm going to go about it. And what I try to share with people and, and I discovered Things like Walter Payton, that mindset of a relentless commitment of every day, not just when it's convenient for you, not when it works for you. That's not how life is. It is every single day. It is that commitment. When you develop that tool and you put that in that tool belt of life, man, it is always there, accessible. Boom, I can use it at any time. It's a powerful tool. It's not just in sports, it's in life. And to get those tools within the tool belt and be able to apply them and see how valuable they are and how powerful the ability to share them. You know, if I'd not, Aristotle had not written stuff and put it out, you know, I'd never, I'd never read that quote. That, that wouldn't give me something on that day I needed. Hearing Walter Payton go, what's the difference between you and everybody else? I want it more than they do every day of the week. And he talked about his routine Monday through Saturday and, and even the Sunday at one o'clock. I can do that. Shoot, anybody can do that. That's a mindset. That, it's about this relentless commitment of every day. It's not, well, if it works for me, yeah, I'll do it, you know. That's going to get you exactly where it gets you, in the same spot. You're not going to go anywhere. But if you're going to plow through those tough days, man, those tough days become easier because you learn to plow through them. You weather that storm. You learn to plow through that. You learn to take that stuff on. And it's nothing to you. And that's a, that's a, that's possible for everybody. So that's what to find a way is about is your self-reflection, you taking ownership, you moving forward on your journey and wherever you're trying to go and you have the tools, just use them. So much power in what you say, because I feel like it speaks to even the younger generation. And I have a lot of different men, women, you know, teenagers actually now listening to, to the podcast. Oh, good. And when they hear your story now, right. And of everything leading up to what would that big piece of advice you would give them? before entering football and really understanding the game and the passion? Because you played football at a time where it was a lot different to where it is now. And I feel like some folks say it's a little bit softer. It's not as grit and all of that. So what would that number one advice be telling you? Well, if it's about foot, just football, um, I can promise you, if, if I put you inside the white lines and handed you the ball, you would not say that. You would not say that the the game has this, they're the best in the world. You know that that's why only a small percentage ever get to play it. You know, I here's why I know. I, first of all, I played it, and then I helped when we needed some direction in football. So it's, it's like about twenty years ago, maybe not quite that far, but we needed to look at the game and clean the game up. And I was, so I was part of the committee. I, it was part of these things that changed. So here's what I did. I actually I go here. Here's how we should look at the game. Okay. What is the art of everything? Okay. What's the art of a tackle? What's the proper way to tackle? Sink, bend your knees, sink your hips. You strike with your shoulder pads, you wrap with your arms. Okay. You don't lead with an elbow. You don't lead with your crown of your helm. Like, in fact, we don't even practice it, by the way. Okay. Everything that we, we function with and practice with and work on as, as tacklers, feet, hips, hands, wrap, tackle, target, right area, I go, you're the best in the world. Let's just let's just go back to cleaning up the game and make people tackle. When you block, let's block properly. You know, as a runner, the same thing goes with a runner. I mean, how do I defend myself as a runner? How do I take on? And listen, as a runner, I, I've, I've coached for a long time, every level. I've coached every level. I've been a head coach, coordinator. I've coached eight to 48. And I this more is applicable to young football players when they're just starting when they're running back they're like well coach you know i, I don't want you know i don't like to i don't like it when they hit me i'm like whoa, whoa that's the wrong mindset you hit them okay and this is how we go about hitting them don't always i understand they're trying to tackle you go but if we play with that mindset that's you're in the wrong position that's not how we should play this position as a running back okay 
we strike them and we learn to strike them. Okay. Well, we don't throw our heads and we don't throw them in. I mean, your feet, hips, hands, these pads were handed to you or were put on you for a reason. These are our weapons. These are our protection. These are what we use. This right here is to protect us. Yeah. We don't use this. Okay. This is just to protect us. And so if you teach the game right and you go about playing it right, listen, and then the other part is hit the opponent as hard as you possibly can. That's part of the challenge with the game you know it's the better the more i can hit you properly and it might not matter in the first quarter but it might matter in the fourth quarter <laughs> exactly you know um you know and then if there's just like personal advice to, to young people i i am actually glad this happened to me as a kid okay I, i'm 60 years old one of the greatest things i ever did as a kid something that sparked me this is my, this is my first passion overall passion Okay, way over football. It started way over. I, I saw a comic book. I saw the Hulk. And I'm like, Spider-Man, Bat, all these guys. I'm like, how do they get bodies like that? How are they built like that? I mean, so I became, you know, this is like, you know, in the 70s. So like, like if you, like, this is when like amino acids come out for the first time. Amino acids, like, oh my gosh, <laughs> amino acids makes you muscle. Okay, right. So exactly. that's just one component of the journey. But it's not like I got I to gotta get amino acids. But my point is, I love taking it. I love investing, love investing in my health. When you think about your, like a leadership, okay, being a leader, okay, at the end of the day, we're all leaders of our bodies. We're leaders of ourselves, okay? The most important thing a leader could ever do, and I, I, I have this leadership presentation I give. It's hard to pick out of the five the number one, but if I have to pick one, it's take care of yourself invest in yourself not not in in all aspects mentally physically and emotionally and spiritually if you do that you're going to be a better person happier person and you're going to be able to lead in a much better way and leading might be okay when you have kids greatest leadership role in america is being a dad mom parent you know you have that responsibility you have a responsibility to your kids and this really came to um, by accident, quite honestly, or um, um, unsolicited, more I should say, my kids we they had on the birthday party, so we all met um, in this location. We rent a home and we spent the week there for my birthday. And my son was like, "Oh, let's get in the hot tub and you know let's let's talk about Poppy." They call me Poppy Show for his birthday. And so <laughs> I'm like, "Okay, so we all get in the hot tub and we're we're sitting there." And it was interesting to listen to the things that resonated with them as kids. It's not what I said, it's what they saw. So like if number two would be modeling and what part of, so what I'm saying about modeling, see my, my son was a really good athlete. He played division one football at BYU. He was a f incredible quarterback. He just had a fabulous athlete. And part of sports is working out and training. So. It's very natural that Bo and I, I help Bo with training and working out and, and eating right and stuff. My daughter, who is more theatrical, and she was in theater and she went up to Broadway and she did, she didn't, I mean, although we were, like I told you, like her and I were really close together, but we didn't, she didn't really jump in the gym a lot. You know, she, she was always dancing and doing all these other activities, but it was actually um both of their passion about health and fitness that they watched me because I, I really never talked to them about it it was and that was actually when i was going through chemotherapy those that bad that entire year of, th of therapy where i kept training and working out in the process that struck them the most and they understood the value of working out and how how they saw it help me and now that is a big component of their life and i honestly Roy, I don't think I've ever mentioned it. Like, um, I'll tell you this: like, I used to hate oatmeal as a kid because the way my parents made it, it was like <laughs> cold, nasty. Like, oh uh, god, like, 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 it right? is eating, like. <laughs> and so I was like, and then I found out how to make oatmeal better, you know, and I put some slivered almonds and some honey in there, and I'm like, and it's not clumpy. And I was eating it one day. I'd never offer it to my kids because I was like, I'd never want them to eat, have to eat that. <laughs> and my kids one day, hey, can I have a bite of that? And I'm like, uh, sure. And Bo takes a bite, Corey takes a bite. I'm like, oh, can we have some of that? And then, then it taught me about how you present things. 
you know, presentation is, is important. You know, even though it's food, I'm like, oh, wow. See, how we present things to people is important. You know, if you, if you create a lumpy oatmeal and it's nasty and cold, I mean, eh, probably not too many people are going to enjoy that. But if it's nice and warm and it's smooth and has a little bit of honey and some sliver all, people might be a little more receptive to it. You know, <laughs> they just taught me a lot of things unsolicited, what they saw. Everything that they that they reflected on, it's what they saw. So how you model yourself, how you care for yourself is important. You, you, got to, you don't want to get to age 40, you know, even 30s or 40s or 50s and go, God, you know, I really am taking care of myself. Doesn't mean you can't turn back the clock because you can. And there's, all, there's never a bad time to start taking care of yourself. If you're 69, you haven't taken care of for 40 years, just start it now. Because you can turn the clock back and give yourself a, a much happier way to live and a, a healthier way to live. But it's probably the number one thing that I am so grateful for that I got into when I was about eight. And I've never let it go. Love that you say that. What are some of the qualities, though, that you look for now when it comes to, like, there's a plethora of players in the league right now that artists, they're phenomenal. You know what I mean? And things like that. And we have our favorites and we have our least favorites and things like that. But what are some of the most, the biggest qualities that you can speak to the youth they should even be looking for from your point of view? Uh, Well, with, 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 Without a doubt, it is those people that A, are accountable, you know, and are responsible for how prepared they are and their relentless commitment to be properly prepared. Um, I use the word being prepared, prepare, you know, number one, I think it's like number one when you're thinking of going after anything, be prepared because you never know where an opportunity is going to come. And always being prepared is responsibility of where you're going. Um, how you take on your, your craft um, as a professional, you know, not just in sports, but just in any life, um, in any aspect of business, you know, first of all, being prepared is number one, being able to be, I mean, have a work ethic, accountable, responsible, um, and have an energy about yourself, um, you know, that you're willing to work on stuff and learn different things, be open um, to know, and I, maybe I don't know everything. Um, that goes into my um, probably my biggest parenting tool, but it turned into a coaching tool, even a business tool. So from a parent, this is how I, I looked at my kids. I judged my kids and the yardsticks of their years and not mine. I, I created that parenting tool so that it could give me patience and perspective. So when my five-year-old son or daughter are doing something that's five, I see it as 35. Okay, I'm 35. I'm looking, and this is what happens with, with people in leadership. You're 35, I've got 35 years experience. I'm watching a five-year-old spilling milk and, and got his shoes untied and I'm like, what? Okay, at 35, that does not seem reasonable. At five, it's pretty reasonable. At five, I was probably doing the same stupid thing, okay? So <laughs> how I present that, you know, how now how, how I handle it is a lot different. I don't handle it like I'm 35, I handle it like I'm five. And I'm like, hey, listen, okay, Look, try not to slow. Here's what we get. Here's this will help you eat. You know, and let's tie our shoes. You know, not not lose your mind on on your five year old. And they're like, geez, my dad, he's he's an idiot or he's always mean. You know, I'm like, because they don't not understand that five years old. And so even in business, you know, now as they got older, I bridged the gap for them to judge me in the yardsticks of my years and not theirs. Meaning I've lived it all. What you're doing right now, what I'm doing, I'm the mistakes I made. I'm giving you information and guidance. So you don't make those mistakes or when they come with that, that crossroad, you have now information on what to do. If you're going to make it this way, if you're going to, if you're going to go down that path, remember it's an arduous, deadly path and it usually ends in destruction. Or if you go this way, I mean, peace and happiness and a lot of success comes this way, but at least you have the information before you make the choice, which I remember as a kid, I was like a lot of times I just, because I know there's peer pressure involved in this too. You know, that's why I, I, I the book I wrote, Brainwashed, it was going to be titled um, A Coach Slash Parent Has All the Power But No Control. Because once they, I, and this started with ESPN, I, analysts would be sitting there with me and they're like, what is that? I cannot believe that they, the coach would allow that player. And I'm like, oh, time out. How do you know what the coach has did all week? Once they step in the white lines of that football field, my, my all bets are off. Like, who's to say that player hadn't been told that a hundred times not to do it? But they chose not to do that when it mattered. It's just like our kids. 
you can teach them and be with them. But when they walk out that front door and then they walk into schools and environments where peer pressure and other things are involved, are they strong enough and equipped to handle things right? Okay, you got to realize there's those, those other influences that can play a role in this. That's why you have to help. I try to help my kids educate them on those, those peer pressures are coming your way, giving them information. They're going to get that. Okay, how do you handle that and ignore it when it's the wrong thing? Because you're going to still be held accountable if you go down that road. You can go down that road with five different people. Those five people aren't going to be standing in front of a judge one day with you. If they are, they're going to be doing it individually. You know, if it's something of a, a real digression or if there's a mistake that's made, they're not coming back here with you to be punished. You are. And this is what's going to happen. You know, like, like drugs, alcohol, and drinking are, you know, all decisions ever, all of us have been put in a position to make. And I remember I did this Say No campaign. It was probably before you were born. The no Say, <laughs> the say No campaign, you know, I was involved in this because it was a big campaign through colleges to find, you know, athletes that would uh, start the campaign, go out and speak to schools and high schools. And I wasn't a big drinker. I never drank drug. <laughs> My senior year, I had I did it one time, and I'm like, I'll never do that again. And so when they asked me to do it, I just realized, I go, you know, you got to make a commitment. Like, you can't go up and say no, say no to drugs, encourage kids to say no to drugs and alcohol, and then be sitting at Pizza Hut having a beer. Okay, one beer, we all know, is not even a big deal. But if you've just said say no, and then they walk in and see you, that's, that's not what they're going to see. They're going to see, oh, you hypocrite. Are you kidding me? You're, I can I'm. I'm old enough. However, that's not that's not the message they're going to get. So I really had to make. I was like, okay, well, I could could never do that out in public, and I never will. That was going to be a problem. But here's what I found with the problem with the say no campaign. First of all, the good thing that was there, there was a campaign, so we were giving kids some information before, but we never gave them real tools on how to handle it. You know, you come up to me, you got all your buddies there. You're three years old, and I am. I'm a sophomore. And when you're at a party and you're the stud of the school and I'm like, I've been looking up to you and you're like, come on, have a beer with this. Man, most people are going to, kids are going to crumble to that. Okay. All right. Without information. If you're going to listen, I don't care who comes up to you. Okay. Alcohol has led to no success by anyone ever. In fact, the only story you're ever going to see is like how it ruined my life. It took me down roads. I didn't belong. Had I not done it, I wouldn't. I wouldn't, I'd be somewhere completely different and happier now and not make the mistakes I get. So if you say no to it, boy, you got reward. You got to get reward on that end too. Okay. You're going to have peace. You're going to have to worry about all of that. That's not going to hold you back in life. And you're not going to be, you're not even of age and all these other things. So if you give them, and guess what? If it's somebody you really admire and you're having a problem, you know, I'm your scapegoat. Okay. I'm your dad. Tell them, go, (laughs) you don't know my dad. Okay. My life's not in jeopardy. Yours is too, if he finds out. Okay. And then we're all going down. And I don't want to do that to you because like, I, I admire you. So I don't want to put that on your, your head, but I, I, I can't, you know, so giving them ways to get out of stuff and giving them information on, if you say yes, here's what's going to be the results. If you say no, here's the results. And you, it just, my, I can't I tell you, I, I, so I did it with my kids and I remember many times, shoot, they'd come home. Hey dad, you know, this, I remember we were driving by uh, the, his elementary school, and he's like, oh, that's the kid that asked me to smoke a cigarette. And I knew him because he was uh, one of my, his best friend's <laughs> older brothers. And it was he just walked me through how he handled it. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that's just – And, you know, I, that's when I thought, man, if, he, if I hadn't really given him ways to handle that, I don't know how he would have handled it. You know, maybe he still had the fortitude to do it right, but at least he had tools to handle it right. You know, and had enough. He, we had a good enough relationship, and I, I kept we'd crept this bridge of communication that he felt comfortable talking to me about it too, which was, which is an important thing, you know. Um, and let's say he had to smoke the cigarette, you know, or said he tried it. Um, you know, one thing I think he tried, it, <clears throat> I've tried not to do, is get so overreacted to it that your kid goes, "Oh, note to self: don't ever tell him anything like that again." You know, it's just a little bit more reasonable and not say that's okay. Just like, well, you know, how'd that taste, you know, or how, you know, that's how you want to be the rest of your life. You know, that's your choice, but think of the things that come with that, you know, and do you want to, do you want to shoulder that? And 
So being able to do that with, with kids at a young age, you know, we're saying, don't do that. Stupid if you do that. Crazy if you do that. It's not, well, that's, that, that's more defense, I think, for young people. They're like, what do you mean? Don't do that, you know? You probably tried it. So give them reasons like, hey, if you do it, here's going to be the results if you say yes. Okay. Pretty much this is what's going to, you're going to see. And if you say no, here's another result. And this is what you get. Here's your reward for it. So, um, and giving them that information. Then as a parent, you have peace because, you know, I really thought I'd give them the best tools possible to handle the scenarios. Still can't be perfect with the whole process. I watch my daughter now, who's a, a great mom. And I'm like, man. You're a really good parent. I'm like, I'm so you're you better than I was. I, which that's I'm not I'm not ashamed of that. I'm just I'm grateful that she's better. She's just better. She's learned, you know, um and she's just better. And I, I admire and love her for that and um I get to learn from her and try to be a better poppy for it. <laughs> I love that you say that. You speak it's it's kind of it's interesting because being on a podcast and then listening to you when you were an analyst and things like that. And now having you on the podcast, what I love is that it's the same, it's the same cadence. It's everything you bring within yourself, that warmth, you know what I mean? When watching you, seeing you on TV and things like that, how do you want your grandkids to really cement your legacy even more when they see, you know, past clips on like YouTube and, seeing you doing all these podcasts? Well, you know, um, it's, it's a good question. Um, and I, I don't know I've ever put much thought into that, but when you're saying that, I'm like, well, the best way is to be true to yourself and be true to, so it has been for 21 years. Here's what I could tell you about everything I ever said. I did all of my research and work that was necessary from the true work, like watching, I'm looking over my tape. I still watch to this day because I do still do the NFL stuff. Vesting the time to give the player and the team the truth and the fan the truth. Uh, watching the game in a highlight, um, TV lies and highlights really lie. There is no way you can tell the truth of a player or a person and to make that observation and assessment is unfair to that person. And I knew that as a player. I, a lot of people do that in the media. It's like they wrote things. I'm like, man, I didn't even come in the locker room and ask a question. How could you possibly know the truth? And if they did, I, the article would be clearly much different if they were going to speak in truth. You know, they're going to tell the truth of things. But that's that's not what they did. And that, that's actually what drove me there. So it's like I'm going to always tell the truth and evidence of the truth. It's almost like being in the court of law. You know, you can't just say something in the court. I got to prove it. Okay. And that's why you got to have the truth and evidence of the truth. You can say one thing, but you better show it. And that's, that's how I always thought about doing television, you know, tell stories and tell the truth and evidence of the truth. Now, sometimes the evidence of the truth makes you out to be, you don't like the guy because he doesn't have the skill set, or they're not doing a to become B. And that rubs people the wrong way. But the one thing I do, I always did, is like, well, there's the evidence right there, okay? You can't deny that, you know? And I always thought the player deserved that too, you know? If I'm going to talk about they're not doing they don't do A, B, and C well, then show A, B, and C. This is what they don't do well. They don't do it consistent enough. That's going to be a problem in the long term. And, and that's the truth, you know? Um, and... People can be angry at that, but they they can. There's a better exception of that than just going, "Oh, they stink. He's terrible." What does that mean? <laughs> what, what is it? Or, or he's awesome. What does awesome mean? I mean, when well, somebody's really good, here's why they're really good. This is the thing that they do that very few other people do, and show it. And and then I don't. And I, I have no regrets in any aspect of that. I can't think of one time. Um, well, actually, I do. I have there's one only one time in my TV career I did it, and I and that was about halfway into my career, oh, about five years, six years into my career, and I I'll never do that again. And it was Maurice Jones Drew when he was coming out for the in the draft from UCLA, 
And I had done all my research on watch salt tape, and he wasn't even projected to go as high as he did. He goes higher. And we go to commercial break, and they're like, hey, Maurice jones Drew just got drafted by the Jacksonville Jaguars. Can you come out and talk about him? And I'm like, well, I didn't see him on tape. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> and they're like, so I should have just said right there, you know, I should have. Okay, if they want me to talk about him, hey, listen, here's the deal. I didn't watch him on tape. Here's his high weight, size, speed, which way did you UCLA. I don't know how that translates. Really what I should have said. I don't know how that translates. They say he's just a third down back. I don't know. I, I don't know that. If he's got numbers, he can catch it. Maybe that's possible. But I don't know him as a runner, which I did not. So what I did is I just took his stats, I took his measurables, and I'm like, he's a third down back. <laughs> you couldn't have missed the target anymore. Okay, you couldn't have been more wrong. Okay? Guessing. Okay, this is what I'm talking about. I chose not to do. And um, of course he doesn't. He like, you know, he becomes a thumper and he's just a he's a really good, I mean a really good back. And so um I was playing in the every year at the Super Bowl, I'd play in the direct TV flag football game. This is a couple years later, and I'm in the green room and I can feel somebody staring at me. And I look over and it's Maurice Jones Drew. And he's he's one of the officials in the game. Okay. He's officiating the game. I'm like, I can't. So he gets up and walks over to me. And as soon as he gets up there, I'm like, I, I already know. He's like, I've always wanted to talk to you. He goes, you know what? Everybody's killing me. We go to commercial break. We come back out. There you are. And I'm like, finally, finally, somebody's going to say the right thing. I said, uh, well, you're right. I was like, I said, I never did that after you. Just so you know, I did it one time and it was you and I learned my lesson. I will never, ever, and I never did it again. If I don't know, if I don't watch tape, I don't have the evidence, I'm like, I don't know. I do not know. I know other people are saying he's great. I don't know if he's really great. I know other people are saying he's terrible. I don't really know if he's terrible if if I haven't watched tape. And um, I've stuck to that. It's my one. It's the, only one I, it's the only one that's ever happened to me. But it was evidence of why I chose to could go down that road. And I, uh, I deviated one time and got – punished for it you know uh, rightfully so because i i went outside my my scope of what i promised myself and uh, why i got into the business in the first place and never did it again i don't know well said you know meryl as we're winding down this show it's it's such like i said podcasting for me is like it's such a, a reward because i get like the inside look before the audience so yeah. When I look at this conversation that we're doing on on the on a holiday here, you know, it's the reason why we show up, you know, we show up to have powerful conversations, learn great insights from a person like you and just know I feel like there's so many people that look up to you with everything that you say, what you what you do, the mission that you're on. So keep that going, my friend. Well, Roy, I tell you this, that's a, that's a true compliment. Um I I I take that um, with great respect because I'm a product of so many people. I've, I've already mentioned them, you know, the Walter Paytons of the world, Aristotle's, the Chuck Knowles. I mean, shoot, for my own kids, my wife. To, I mean, there's so many people that if I show, I said their names, you're like, who's that? I mean, we all are a product of people, you know, and we learn from one another. I tell people individually we're strong, but collectively we're powerful, you know, getting resources from other people, taking that nugget you heard and going, Oh, wow. I never thought of that. You know, the teacher standing in front of me at 10 years old going, write your goals down, pin them up in your room. N not thinking that for 50 years later, I'm still going to be doing it. And that's like been so it's important in my life. Um thankful for all those people. And so to be able to share this, be with you. Um, I appreciate your, um, how buttoned up you are too. You know, you're good at this. Um, I know a little bit about interviews. You do a good job. You're very comfortable with, and you listen. Just don't uh, don't uh, don't forget that part of being a great interviewer is being a good listener. I learned that a lot at ESPN, so you do a good job of that. And thanks for allowing me to be a part of uh, your team and your audience. No, oh, thank you, thank you. Before we end the show, though, plug your information where everybody can check you out the merch because I'm going to support 100. Yeah. And, and well, you're a good man, Rory. Good they, uh, I, uh, you, Merrill Hodge .com is my website that's you know my speaking so that's really i've got everything there 
everything there, how, how you can contact me um, for speaking or other other things that you might um, be thinking of. Um, my books and hats and shirts are are all there if you uh, if you feel uh, inclined. I uh, you know I when I go speak with people, are you selling your book today? And I'm, I've never been like that. I never actually when I go speak, we use the offer to give twenty books out. I'm not one for. Um, I don't know. I don't want to hit people. You, you send a message and go, oh, by the way, buy my book. I don't. <laughs> I'm like, ah, that's just, I, that ain't me. I just can't. <laughs> yeah. I can't do that. You know, if here's what I'd rather. Like, oh man, that, that moved me. You know, I'm gonna. I want to buy that book. That's. Because if I'm in the audience, that's how I feel. I know everybody's not the same with that, but I'm like, I'm like, man, I'm gonna go buy that book. Walter Payton. Okay, um, I, when I heard out he's putting winning life of type, winning of life, his winning in life tape out. He didn't say, "Hey, buy my winning in life tape." I heard about him. I'm getting that because the guy had done so many things already. I'd heard about. There's got to be more there. That's why I got it, and that's that's guess I, how I always look at things. Like you know, if they meant something to him. And they think, well, there's more there. What's there? Go get, I'll go want to read his book. And that, that, that would be, that's somebody that's probably going to read it too, you know, versus, you know, feeling like you got to buy something that, you know, I just, I'm just, not, I just not, it's just not me. No, I hear you. I hear you. Well, I do appreciate you. Like I said, you got him a friend. Yeah. Appreciate Absolutely. you coming on the podcast, all that good stuff. And uh, definitely, man, definitely going to always be looking at you through social media and, what you have coming up to you never know maybe you might end up in toronto you know what i mean hey you never know um it's been a while since i've been in toronto but i've um i i do get i actually got to toronto to to meet with doctors actually up there that do a lot of great research so could we be back there again we'll stay in touch okay definitely i appreciate you man you got it buddy thanks roy yeah.